Hey guys, Veronica, Andrew, and Nate here. We are Foodies, Foodies Watching, Watching movies. movies, a podcast dedicated to awesome movies, great food, and that's about it. Check us out on the JIC Network at www.journeyintocomics.com. Maybe throw some money over to our Patreon so we can eat this week. And now your feature presentation. The following, following. the following is a journey into comics. Journey into comics. It's a journey into comics. It's a journey into comics. Journey into comics. Journey into comics. Network. 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 Production. Production. We interrupt the Journey into Comics Network feed for this late-breaking edition of Four News, featuring Andrew Four. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is Poor News Episode 8. Yes, Episode 8. We are 8 episodes into this season of the show. and season's a little bit of a loose term. We'll probably be keep running this thing continuously. There'll be a small change in format uh, towards the end of this year as I take some time off for the wedding. Um, and if you listen to Adulting It Easy, the other show that I co-host with my fiance Liz, you need to hear all about that. But for right now... This is the news show we talk about. On Porn News, we talk about the political news, the international news, the stuff that's not as entertaining as what you can find on Porn Entertainment, which is the show I run opposite this show on Tuesdays. And last week was, uh, or two weeks ago was a little bit different, and then last week was the holidays, and I recorded Porn Entertainment early as the Stanley tribute. So it's been a little bit since I've actually recorded an episode, so I'm a little, feel a little rusty at this, but let's just kind of jump right in with what we were talking about this week. And there's been some big news and starting out, I hope everyone had a happy Thanksgiving. I know for me it was a little bit good, a little bit bad. It's just kind of the nature of the holiday. But uh, overall, it was nice to go see my family and uh, just get in and relax, take some power from work. So, give that. But what everyone knows kind of follows Thanksgiving, and that is the infamous shopping day, which is Black Friday. Now, Black Friday, usually everyone kind of plans to, they've... It's been slowly creeping up as I've gotten older from a Friday morning thing to a Thursday evening thing into some stores that don't even close on Thursday at all. So I didn't do any Black Friday shopping on Thursday, but Friday uh, around lunchtime, uh, my family and I went out and tried a few things. I got some clothes and a couple more adulting things like some Tupperware and a frying pan. But hey, that's the nature of the beast. But I also bought some movies because you know, if anyone knows me, knows I have a big movie collection and I like to collect them. But looks like some companies weren't expecting the success from Black Friday this year, and they lost out on millions because of it, from this article from Business Insider has to say. So Black Friday sales set records this year, but that doesn't mean the shopping bonanza was nothing but sunshine and daisies for retailers. Black Friday online sales hit $6.22 billion, according to Adobe Analytics data, up by 23.7% from $5.03 billion last year. The surrounding days, online sales were equally impressed. The shoppers spent $2.4 billion online on Wednesday, up 31.8% from last year. Thanksgiving Day, online sales hit $3.7 billion, representing a 28% growth year over year, which is kind of ridiculous. Don't even shop online on Thanksgiving. I know I can't say much. I did too, but that's probably should be more than that. But online's a little bit different because no one's there processing it. It's usually handled by a lot by computers, and then they handle it the next day when they come in. Thanksgiving weekend was the biggest online shopping weekend in American history, as sales reached $6.4 billion. While store foot traffic was slightly down, in-store sales were expected to have grown as well, resulting in a record-breaking kickoff to the holiday shopping season. Total spend for Black Friday weekend is predicted to reach roughly $59.6 billion, according to estimated by Global Data Retail. That would represent an increase of 5.7% over sales during the same period last year. Thanksgiving Day to the following Sunday, the best growth rate in the United States since the post-recession Black Friday boom in 2011. But the sales exposure created some new problems for retailers. Sold-out goods proved to be a significant problem. Some deals items, such as the Nintendo Switch and the Instant Pot, sold out before Thanksgiving Day was even over. According to Adobe, 3.2% of some products pages saw out-of-stock messages on Thanksgiving, costing retailers an estimated $120 million in sales. The out-of-stock messages continued with retailers losing out on $177 million on Black Friday, 2.85% of product pages, and $140 million over the weekend, representing 2.18%. Retailers' lack of preparation for the eruption of early online sales also rolled in several technical difficulties, which Walmart, Lowe's, J. Crew, and more dealt with on Wednesday, Thanksgiving Day, and Black Friday. Walmart's technical issues affect an estimated 3.6 million shoppers, according to an analysis by the retail aggregator Love the Sales, 
which found the tech problems lasted about 150 minutes and cost the retailer an estimated $9 million in lost sales. For customers, it's easy to go to a different site and spend their holiday money elsewhere. Bob Buffon, the chief technology officer at the web-optimized software company Yoda, Y-O-T-T-A-A, told Business Insider on Thursday, Depending on how long the site is down, it can cost retailers a lot of money and also results in damage to the brand as shoppers take to social media to express their frustrations. As shoppers moved online and began looking for deals earlier, Black Friday sales test whether retailers are ready for this year's holiday season. And while many companies are celebrating the record same day, not everyone passed the test. So, looks like that was fun for a lot of people. Uh, hopefully you had a safe Black Friday shopping. And staying within the kind of the business realm is some kind of unfortunate news, and that is that GM, big auto manufacturer, is to idle plants and cut thousands of jobs as sales slow. General Motors announced Monday that it planned to idle five factories in North America and cut roughly 14,000 jobs in a bid to trim costs. It was a drawing reflection of the auto industry's adjustments to changing consumer taste and sluggish sales. This move, which follows job reductions by Ford Motor Company, further pairs the workforce in a sector that President Trump has promised to bolster. Referring to GM's chief executive, Mary T. Barra, he told reporters, I spoke to her, and I stressed the fact that I'm not happy with what she did. Mr. Trump also invoked the rescue of GM after its bankruptcy filings almost a decade ago. You know the United States saved General Motors, he told reporters, and for her to take that company out of Ohio is not good. I think she's going to put something back in soon. In addition to an assembly plant in Lordstown, Ohio, the cuts affected factories in Michigan, Maryland, and the Canadian province of Ontario. Part of the retrenchment is a response to a slowdown in new car sales that has prompted automakers to slim their operations and shed jobs. And earlier, bets on smaller cars have had to be unwound as consumers have gravitated towards pickup trucks and sports utility vehicles in response to low gasoline prices. In addition, automakers have paid a price for the trade battle that Mr. Trump set in motion. In June, GM slashed its profit outlook for the year because tariffs were driving up production costs, raising prices even on domestic steel. Rising interest rates are also generating headwinds. Ms. Barr said no single factors prompted GM's cutbacks, portraying them as a prudent trimming of sales. We're taking these actions now while the company and the economy are strong to stay in front of the... Uh, sorry, cat decided to hop on the computer. To stay in front of a fast-changing market, she said on a conference call with analysts. The idling of the five plants next year will result in the layoffs of 3,300 production workers in the United States and about 2,500 in Canada. The company also aims to trim its salaried staff by 8,000. The cuts represent more than 10% of GM's North American workforce of 124,000 people. Investors welcome the news, sending GM shares up 4.8% to their highest closing price in about three months. Word of the cutbacks in Canada has serviced over the weekend. Just before GM's announcement, workers walked out of the plant in Oshawa, Ontario, into a driving rain, waving red flags and clad in ponchos bearing the logo of their union. Unifor. They began blockading truck entrances. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said he expressed his deep disappointment about the closing to Ms. Barra. The United Auto Workers, representing workers of the American plant, said GM's move will not go unchallenged. Closing those plants while expanding production in China and Mexico is profoundly damaging to our American workforce, said the union vice president in charge of negotiations with GM Terry Dietz, D-I-T-T-E-S. The plants include three car factories, one in Lordstown that makes the Chevrolet Cruze Compact, the Detroit Hamtrak plant where the Chevrolet Volt, Buick LaCrosse, and Kylex CT6 are produced, and a plant in Oshawa, Ontario, which primarily makes the Chevrolet Impala. In addition, the company will halt operations at transmission plants in the Baltimore area and in Warren, Michigan. <clears throat> GM, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler are all poised to negotiate new labor contracts next year. Some of the affected GM plants could resume production depending on the outcome of the bargaining. Carmakers often agree to keep plants open in exchange for other concessions from the union. Earlier this year, Ford announced it would stop making sedans for the North American market and announced cuts in its workforce. Fiat Chrysler stopped making small and mid-sized cars in 2016. Closing auto plants outright rather than idling them, as GM says it plans, has been rare since the industry emerged from the recession. The last permanent shutdown of a plant in the United States came in 2016 when Mitsubishi Motors shuttered one in Normal, Illinois. I actually knew where that one was because I went to school in Peoria, which isn't that far from normal. Before that, Fours closed a truck plant in St. Paul in 2011. More typically, since rebounding from the recession, car makers and their suppliers have restarted shuttered plants, adding new ones across the South and hiring tens of thousands of workers a year. But demand for small size and mid sized cars have plunged. Two thirds of all new vehicles sold last year were trucks and SUVs. That shift has hit GM's Lordstown plant hard. 
Just a few years ago, the factory employed three shifts of workers to churn out Chevy Cruises. Now it's down to one. In 2017, the plant made about 180,000 cars, down from 248 in 2013. More broadly, the year-long boom in cars and truck sales in North America appear to be ending, said John Hoffecker, uh, vice chairman at Alex Partners, a global consulting firm with a large automotive practice. This has held up well this year, but we do see a downturn coming, he said. Alex Partners forecasts that domestic auto sales will fall to about 50 million cars and light trucks in 2020 from about 17 million this year. Even though they are facing a potential slump, car makers continue to spend heavily to develop electric vehicles and self-driving technology, both to meet regulatory mandates and to anticipate the future of driving. That shift is expected to remake the global industry and enable companies to enter new and potentially lucrative businesses such as driveless taxi and delivery services. At the same time, automakers have had to contend with a new political agenda in Washington. One benefit of the corporate tax cuts enacted last year, the changes championed by Tr- Mr. Trump and his party saves GM $157 million in federal taxes in the first nine months of the year, according to the company's most recent quarterly earnings report. Trump administration has moved to scrap str- stringent emissions requirements put in place under Pre- President Barack Obama. The industry hopes that Mr. Trump will relent and reach an agreement with California, which has its own emissions requirements. Automakers are wary of having two sets of standards. Before the election, after Mr. Trump prodded Ford, GM, and other plants to build the United States instead of Mexico or China, as events have played out, however, his determination to rework the North America Free Trade Agreement is expected to have a modest impact on automakers, preserving much of the original 1994 accord. The terms negotiated with Canada and Mexico stipulate that at least 75% of an automobile's value must be produced in North America for a company to import into the United States duty-free and that 4-45% to of a vehicle's value must consist of parts made by workers earning at least 16 an hour, a provision aimed at shrinking Mexico's wage advantage. Analysis believe that changes will have little to no effect on American jobs. Overall, the American auto industry has added nearly 350,000 jobs since the industry bottomed out in the wake of the recession. But the industry still employs tens of thousands fewer people than before the crisis and hundreds of thousands fewer than in 2000. About 970,000 people worked in the United States auto industry in October, an increase of 12,800 since Mr. Trump took office. Most of that growth, however, came among auto manufacturers, came came among manufacturers of recreational vehicles and trailers, as well as in auto parts. Through October, automakers like GM had cut about 7,000 jobs under Mr. Trump's government figures show. Those numbers don't include the hundreds of thousands of workers employed by auto dealers, repair shops, and related industries. Ms. Barr said GM would set aside up to $2 billion in cash to pay for the job reductions announced Monday and take non-cash charges against its pre-tax earnings of about $1.8 billion. The charges will affect earnings in the fourth quarter of 2018 and the first quarter of 2019. Until last month, GM had been offering severance packages to entice salaried employees in North America to leave the company. In January, the company plans to cunt. Additional white-collar jobs on an involuntary basis. Between the two actions, it aims to eliminate about 15% of its salaried jobs in North America. General Mosul also said on Monday that it would stop production at two unspecified plants outside North America by the end of next year. So that's just lovely. And I know I have some friends in the auto industry, specifically if anyone listens to anything else on the network, uh, that Subaru plant in Indiana. So hopefully this isn't a trend we're seeing and uh, the auto industry kind of resumes a lot of their operations on the U.S. soil. So, and keeping it in the kind of the Trumposphere moving, uh, which is more fun, and that involves Trump and new tariffs. Trump dims hopes of China trade deal with fresh tariff threats on Apple phones. President Donald Trump appears to be shutting the door on a temporary ceasefire in an ongoing tit-for-tat trade war with China just days ahead of an upcoming summit in Argentina. The president told the Wall Street Journal interview published Monday that it was highly unlikely he would accept an offer by Chinese leader Xi Jinping aimed at adverting Trump's plan to raise tariffs on more than $200 billion of Chinese goods to 25% in January. He also warned once again he was poised to slap a third round of tariffs on Chinese goods if the two leaders fail to broker an end of the trade rift when they meet later this week in Buenos Aires, Argentina on the sidelines of the G20 summit. If we don't make a deal that I'm going to put the $267 billion additional on, said Trump in an interview, and the tariff level could be 10 or 25%. So it's an interview that that could include tariffs on Apple products imported from China, including iPhones and laptops. Apple stock fell 1.5% in an hour after hours trading, erasing earlier gains from the day. 
Maybe, maybe depends on what the rate is the president said. I mean, I could make it 10% and people could stand that very easily. The tariffs have drawn complaints from American businesses who are responsible for paying the import duties. It also spurred concerns about renewed inflation just as the Federal Reserve is set to raise interest rates in December. More than 100 S&B companies have already preemptively telegraphed from the third quarter earnings calls that damage further tariffs would impose on the U.S. economy. Multiple companies, including Walmart, the country's biggest retailer, have warned that prices on everyday goods like shampoo detergents and paper goods such as napkins will get more expensive for consumers. In lead-up to this Wednesday's leaders meeting, Trump's surrogates have continuously warned Beijing negotiators that threats by the president should be taken seriously. Vice President Mike Pence said earlier this month that Trump wasn't in any rush to end the trade war and was willing to more than double the tariffs that already had placed on $250 billion in Chinese goods. The United States will not change course until China changes its ways, Pence said in a speech at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in Papua New Guinea. The upcoming meeting is the only imminent opportunity for a direct encounter between Trump and Xi before January 1 deadline, and investors are eagerly looking for signs for a truce between the two sides. Speaking of the South Lawn with reporters, Trump hedged bets on any possible deal-making with his Chinese counterpart. It could happen. They have to treat us fairly, he said. While so far much of the attention on the undue harm of the existing tariffs has fallen on China, political scientists and economists also warn there could be deeper ramifications for America's corporations if the Chinese opts to restrict American investment. A lot of the problem for the business is uncertainty, said David Dollar, a senior fellow in the John L. Thornton's China Center at the Brookings Institution and a former economic and financial emissary to China for the Treasury Department under President Barack Obama. They can live with whatever policy regime there is, whether we're taxing everything from China or not. They just hate the uncertainty. And that makes two of us. And moving from one foreign country to another, and that involves Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who pushed the Trump administration officials to inflate value of Saudi arms deal. President Trump's advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, directed administration officials to inflate numbers for supposed $110 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia, ABC News reported on Monday. Two U.S. officials and three former White House officials told the network that Kushner pressed the State and Defense Department to pump up the numbers to $110 billion by including aspirational arms sales. Saudi Arabia so far has only signed letters of offer and acceptance for $14.5 billion in sales of helicopters, tanks, ships, weapons, and training, according to the Pentagon. The figures reportedly inflated, however, to attempt to solidify the new alliance between the Trump administration and Saudi Arabia, and made a clear victory for the president's first foreign trip last year. Defense Secretary James Mattis also supported touting the overblown amount first announced in May 2017, when the U.S. signed a memorandum of intent with the Saudis to jointly pursue the foreign military sales over the next 10 years, according to ABC. Mattis himself endorsed the memorandum, a former National Security Council official familiar with the matter told the network. We need to sell them as much as possible, Kushner reportedly told colleagues at NSC meeting weeks ahead of the trip. Officials initially told Kushner the Pentagon realistically had roughly $15 billion worth of deals in the pipeline, there was then a back and forth between Kushner and the Defense and State Department's official how to get to a large number, another U.S. official told the network. The MI reportedly does not include details about the quantity and type of defense weapons to be purchased, with some carrying a to-be-determined label for delivery dates and quantities. The Defense and State Departments have offered a few details on the memo, but there is no public breakdown on pending foreign military sales. The five-page list of possible arms sales also notes that the document does not create an authority to perform any work, award, any contract, Issue articles from stock, transfer funds, and otherwise obligate or create a binding commitment in either way for the United States or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. A state part official told ABC that the list was made up of armaments, armaments sorry, that Saudi officials had expressed interest in, as well as equipment the U.S. defense analysts had flagged as among Riyadh's needs. Since the memo has been signed, little movement has been made on further sales. The Saudis let up pass the September deadline for one of the most expensive items on the list, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Anti-Ballistic Missile System worth a potential $15 billion. No solid agreement is yet in place. An NSC spokesperson said the White House and the State and Defense Departments worked tirelessly with Saudi counterparts to devise the figured listed in the memo based on rigorous analysis of Saudi requirements and, optim and an optimal U.S. solutions. The military sales have been thrown into the spotlight in recent months as Trump had doubled down on diplomatic and financial ties between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, following the assassination of journalist Jamal Khalasi. The day earlier this month announced it has high confidence that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman offered the death, ordered the death of Khalasi. Such a hard name to say. Khalasi. Khashoggi. 
I, I don't know. But Trump last week attempted to throw doubt on the analysis. Trump sent a statement that maybe the crown prince ordered the num- murder, or maybe he didn't. He also lauded the kingdom as a steadfast partner and said the arms deal with the country will create hundreds of thousands of jobs, tremendous economic development, and much additional wealth for the United States. Yeah, I, I don't even know what to say about this. It just seems like the story is constantly changing, like shifting sand. So, keeping up with the Trump administration goes to Paul Manafort. Uh, Paul Manafort lied after pleading guilty, Mueller team said, or uh, Mueller's team says. Paul Manafort has breached his plea agreement with the Justice Department by lying to the FBI and Special Counsel Robert Mueller uh, two months after he started to cooperate in the Russia probe, prosecutors alleged Monday. Manafort lied on various on a variety of subject matters, violating his plea agreement, prosecutors said in a three-page filing signed by both the defense team and prosecution. Both sides asked the judge to now move his case towards sentencing. Manafort states as part of the filing that he does not agree with the prosecutor's description. He believes he has provided truthful information and does not agree with the government's characterization that he has breached the agreement. The document states the special counsel's office says it will provide more details at a later date. The filing on Monday was an astonishing break from the bare-bones update given by the special counsel's office and other cooperators' cases. It indicates not only did Manafort speak extensively with the Justice Department prosecutors for their investigation, but also believed they were able to verify or refute information he gave them. Manafort pleaded guilty guilty to conspiracy and witness tampering on September 14th. Manafort, though... Uh, he has not made public statements since then, was thought to be a star cooperator in the special counsel's ongoing probe into Russia's interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election and possible coordination with the Trump campaign. The former Trump campaign chairman has met with prosecutors at least nine times, amounting to hours of discussion about what he knows. As part of this plea deal, Manafort admitted to coming up, committing a host of money laundering and foreign lobbyist crimes and fraud, giving the federal prosecutors ample leverage over him. He has been held in Virginia jail since June. When he was last seen in public in a Virginian federal courtroom about a month ago, Manafort was in a wheelchair and suffering from a health issue similar to gout. He was sentenced in February in his criminal case in Virginia, which he took to trial and lost. So that's always fun. We'll kind of see what actually comes of that. And also something that was quietly buried on Black Friday, and that is... The Trump administration released a major climate assessment on Black Friday, the culmination of years of research by the country's top climate scientists... It's well over a thousand pages and touched on daunting range of topics. President Trump said Monday that he has read parts of it. It's fine, he told reporters at the White House, although he has said he doesn't believe the reporter's assessment that climate change will cause devastating economic impacts for the U.S. Really, do tell. Um, the report is required by Congress every four years and is issued by 13 federal agencies and the U.S. Global Change Research Program. This one marks the most detailed and blunt assessment of the dangers of unchecked global warming. Climate change is happening here and now, co-author Catherine Hayhoe of Texas Tech University told Econ Edition Saturday. It's affecting all of us no matter where we live, and the more climate changes, the more serious and even more dangerous the impacts will become. Here are some key points. Climate change will be expensive. Some parts of the U.S. economy could suffer hundreds of billions of dollars in annual losses by the end of the century unless global greenhouse gas emissions are substantially reduced, the report finds. Already there's the impact of increasingly frequent and intense extreme weather events, The report notes that large wildfires are more frequent and that the areas burned by lightning lightning ignited fires are expected to increase by at least 30% by 2060. The costs for fighting fires and forest management are on the rise, but there are others less obvious risks. Increasing rain and humidity could cause agricultural productivity to fall in the Midwest, and warming oceans will hurt fisheries along the coasts. More severe flooding threatens billions of dollars worth of property and infrastructure, which in turn could affect the economic stability of local governments, businesses, and the broader economy. Extreme weather events could also cause price spikes and interrupt international trade. As an example, the report notes that flooding in Thailand in 2011 disrupted production of Ford and Honda's vehicles in the U.S. and cost a U.S.-based hard drive manufacturer $199 million in losses. Again, the rise of extreme events like wildfires, floods, and storm surge pose the most immediate danger to public health and well-being. The report finds that with the continued warming, heat-related deaths will increase. The warming climate and more frequent and intense rain might also expand the range of ticks and mosquitoes exposing more people to diseases like West Nile, uh, dengue fever, chicken gaia, and Lyme. Climate change could also worsen harmful ozone levels and air pollution. That could send more people to the hospital for aggravated asthma and respiratory or cardiovascular problems and could even increase premature deaths. As with so many climate impacts, the report notes that 
Those most at risk could include children, the adult, elderly, and low-income communities. The U.S. infrastructure was not built for these changes. Most of the American infrastructure is already aging and deteriorating, and it's taking a pounding from extreme weather. In some places, more intense rain and salt water intrusion has led to dam failures, bridge and road closures, and power outages. Heavy downpours can also overwhelm sewer systems, causing untreated water to flow into rivers. In the West, prolonged drought has forced utilities to cut back on electricity production from hydropower. Extreme re- heat and higher demand can also raise the risk of power outages. The reports notes that the power outages can affect drinking water treatment, among many other services people take for granted. Intense rain, flooding, and heat can also hurt the nation's vast network of transportation, shutting down major highways and coastal airports and halting freight movement. So what's the risk ahead? The report, like most climate studies, offers different scenarios for how fast the climate change will how fast climate will change and how and by how much. The bigger the change, the greater the consequences for everything from heat waves to hurricanes. What is the issue statement criticizing the report is largely based on most extreme scenario for emissions of greenhouse gases. The report is in fact based on mostly on two scenarios. One of the most severe view in which Little or no effort is made to lower emissions. However, it also used a more moderate scenario, one that sees more aggressive actions to reduce emissions that are currently underway. Less fossil fuel use, for example, or more efficient vehicles and buildings. And for some of its chapters, the report considers a third, far rosier future where emissions are drastically re- reduced and even where greenhouse gases are pulled back out of the atmosphere. Effects on people and the economy are considerably less dire under these scenarios than in the most severe one. The good news is that this, in this dire report is that the scores of local and state governments are taking action to lower their own carbon emissions and cope with climate impacts. Some of these impacts will get worse still no matter what as they are locked in due to historical emissions. The report makes clear that changes today can make a big difference. It's absolutely not too late to take action, says Brenda Eckwurzel, a co-author and senior climate scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Now that's a union name. The report states that more than half of the projected damages of coastal property are estimated to be avoidable through well-timed adaption measures. But Eckwurzel cautioned that we can't merely adapt our way out of this mess. The cost of adaption could be quite high and it may never be enough, she says. But costs will rarely start skyrocketing if we don't start reigning in emissions. And just kind of wrap things up here, let's move on from U.S. news to a little bit of international news, and that one involves our former leaders, and that involves what's going on in England, and that involves Brexit, and specifically Theresa May as she defends a deal amid criticism from uh, MPs. Theresa May has defended a proposed Brexit deal in the Commons in the face of substantial criticism from the opposition and many Conservative MPs. She said the deal delivered on the results of the EU referendum and MPs will get to vote on it on December 11th. But she admitted she was not entirely happy with the backstop contingency plan to avoid a hard border in Ireland. Jeremy Corbyn said plowing on with a deal opposed by the public and MPs was an act of national self-harm. The late Labour leader says the Parliament would have little choice but to reject the deal with MPs' vote on it. Most of former Tory cabinet ministers, including uh, Lane Duncan, Smith, Boris Johnson, Owen Patterson, Michael Fallon, and Dominic Grieve, also said the deal was unsatisfactory during the two and a half hour debate. Lib Dern, senior, or Lib, Lib Dem leader Sir Vince Cable, joined a number of Labour MPs and Green Party's Carolyn. Lucas is calling for the Prime Minister to back another EU referendum with the option of remaining in the European Union. Mrs. May rejected all of these calls and told Sir Vince it was time to deliver on the choice that the British people made in the 2016 referendum. Mrs. May faced an uphill struggle to persuade MPs to accept the terms of the withdrawal agreement and a political declaration on future relations between the EU and UK approved by EU leaders on Sunday. Now, what was May's pitch to MPs? Mrs. May said there had been give and take in the 19-month negotiations, but the final agreement delivered for the British people by regaining control of laws, money, and borders. She acknowledged concerns over arrangements to avoid the return of physical checks on the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which would see the UK enter a customs arrangement with the EU known as the backstop. The backstop was an insurance policy no one wants to use, Mrs. May told MPs, and she insisted the UK would have the right to determine whether it came into the force in the UK's future relationship was not settled by the end of 2020, and she hoped it would. 
A backstop of some kind would be required, she said, due to the UK's obligation to uphold the Good Friday Agreement, the Northern Ireland peace deal signed 20 years ago, and there's no deal that comes without a backstop, and without a backstop there is no deal. She also said she had stood firm in the face of repeated EU attempts to link access to British waters for their fishermen to future trade arrangements amid claims from the SNP and others that her deal had sold out Scotland's fishermen. And because Nate always gives me crap for criticizing his water breaks and shouting this up, this water break is courtesy of Nate Phillips of Journey into Comics. <sighs> now that's good stuff. Now the PMO said she regretted saying in a speech last week that Brexit would prevent EU migrants jumping the queue. The comment sparked an angry backlash from EU citizens living in the UK. The Labour leader said Mrs. May had brought home a botch deal that would leave the UK worse off and that plowing on it is not stoic, it's an act of national self-harm. So the Prime Minister needed a plan B involving permanent customs arrangement and stronger employment and environmental protections, which is Labour's Brexit policy. This deal is not a plan for Britain's future, he added, that, and that why, uh, was why MPs had little choice but to reject it. <sighs> Sorry, getting a little late in the day here. Caroline Flint, one of the few Labour's MPs who had signaled that it could vote for the deal, urged Mrs. May and Mr. Corbyn to hold face-to-face -face talks to reach an accommodation acceptance to both parties. A Downing Street spokesman said the Prime Minister had no plans to reach out personally to Labour MPs who might back a deal, although her Chief of Staff had invited opposition MPs to a briefing on the agreement on Monday evening. The SNP's Lane Blackford said the agreement was full of ifs and buts which could result in a Scottish fisherman being sold out. And the DUP's Nigel Dodd said the backstop was bad for the United Kingdom and bad for the economy, and absolute certainty was needed over its legal application. Tory backbencher Mark Francois was among a host of MPs to urge PM to think again, claiming the agreement was as dead as a dodo and would not get through Parliament. The House of Commons never surrendered to anyone, he said it won't start now. And former Defense Secretary Sir Michael Fallon, previously regarded as a loyalist, said it would be a huge gamble for the UK to surrender our vote and our veto without any firm commitment to frictionless trade outside of the EU. Former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson said it was hard to see how the deal could provide certainty to business when cabinet ministers were saying different things about what they wanted. Following the debate, Mrs. May was due to host more than 100 investors and employers from sectors including manufacturing, retail, food and drink, and financial services to discuss the Brexit plan. Theresa May told... Uh, Theresa May told MPs her plan was in the national interest delivering on the referendum result while protecting the economy. But if the debate is a taste of things to come, the Prime Minister is in big trouble. One MPF and the Remainers and Leavers alike are across already spoke out against Mrs. May's plan. Indeed, rarely can a Prime Minister receive such a mauling. Mrs. May now has just over two weeks to try and rally support in Parliament. Asked for really for MPs what the plan B was if she lost the vote, she avoided a direct answer. So we'll kind of see if Brexit is dead as a dodo as one of the MPs had said, but we'll kind of go from here. And jumping back from the European area, or at least possibly a former European Union member, to someone more close to home, and that involves Mexico's new leaders are facing clash with Trump over migrant caravan. The new president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, has built his entire political career on defending the poor. Now, days before he takes office, President Trump is testing how firmly he will live up to that. Thousands of migrants from Central America have massed along the border of Mexico and the United States, with thousands more on the way. American Border Patrol agents fired tear gas at them on Sunday to prevent hundreds from reaching the border. Mr. Trump has vowed to keep the migrants on Mexican soil while they apply for asylum in the United States, a process that could squeeze them into squalid, overcrowded shelters for months, possibly even years. Mexican officials say the strain is already causing a humanitarian emergency, creating a political crisis for Mr. Lopez Obrador even before he takes office. Mexico's foreign ministry said Monday if he, it had presented a diplomatic note to the United States Embassy asking for an exhaustive investigation into the use of non-lethal weapons at the border on Sunday, where at least two dozen tear gas containers released by American agents landed in Mexico. But the statement said Mexico would continue to cooperate with the United States on migration. <clears throat> Later, the White House Mr. Trump defended the use of tear gas and said there's 
They're not coming into the United States. They will not be coming into our country. Although images showed families with children running from the gas, Mr. Trump said we don't use it on children. After more than 15 years of campaigning as a leftist firebrand, Mr. Lopez Obrador must with must swiftly decide will he stand up to Mr. Trump and defend the migrants' pleas to be allowed in the United States, if many of their asylum requests will ultimately be rejected, or will the uh, or will he act? Uh, acquiesce to Mr. Trump's demands and the economic imperative of good relations with the United States. The Mexican government is in a dead-end alley, said Raul Benitez Menot, a professor of international relations at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Lopez Obrador is facing a baptism of fire and a dilemma on whether he should maintain his promises of humanitarian policies or stop the masses of migrants trying to reach the U.S. <clears throat> Members of the new Mexican administration which will take office on Saturday will view this situation with alarm. Top cabinet ministers have been preparing for, on Sunday to discuss what to do about the standoff with the United States and their own country's growing frustration with thousands of poor migrants streaming in from Central America when their agenda was hijacked by the fracas at the border. Suddenly the incoming ministers found themselves watching videos of hundreds of migrants including small children rushing toward the border gates and getting tear gassed by American border agents. Mr. Lopez Abador was was promised jobs and visas to migrants traveling north. Now, as the Square's loyalty campaign promises, with some nettle some international realities, as the whole world watches. The question is which version of Mr. Lopez Obrador will be facing off against Mr. Trump? <sighs> Unpredictable, temperamental, beloved by his base and loathed by his detractors, Mr. Lopez Obrador, known by his initials AMLO, has been carried more than once to Mr. Trump. And as is often the case with the American president, even as close as aides say they're not sure which Mr. Lopez Obrador will emerge, the avuncular leader who preaches love and mortality, the leftist firebrand who skewered opponents, the pragmatist aiming for a broader development deal for the region, or the impetuous politician who seems to make it up as he goes along. For now, the new administration is being careful not to paint itself into a corner, not one that has not taken office yet. We have little margin right now because we don't have our own operations, said Marcelo Ebrard, the incoming foreign minister. Right now we are just spectators. The disturbance of the border underscored the uh, sorry. The disturbance at the border underscored the fragility of the situation as more migrants from Central America gather as many as ten thousand expected to reach Tijuana in the coming weeks. The urgency to manage the chaos grows by the day. Top officials in Mr. Lopez Obrador's new government view the images of migrants trying to force the way in the United States will heighten the anti-immigrant settlements that Mr. Trump has channeled so effectively in the United States. That can make it even harder to strike a resolution that involves compromise. But while Mr. Lopez Obrador has promised humane treatment for migrants passing through or staying in Mexico, it is unclear what his country will get for housing tens of thousands of migrants as they await asylum. This is from Backlog American Courts. The team around Mr. Lopez Obrador Apridor is acutely aware that Mexico has long demanded humane treatment for its own migrants in the United States. Now Mexico is facing scrutiny for how it treats migrants. Local officials in Tijuana warned the, this weekend they cannot shoulder the cost of the migrants and they blame the federal government for not providing money to open another shelter to handle the overcrowding. For the time being, the city is cramming migrants into a sports center that already looked like an overwhelmed refugee camp. And many Mexicans are growing increasingly frustrated with the migrants' presence, worried that they will take away jobs, resources, and government attention from Mexican citizens. On Monday, Mexico increased federal police presence outside the sports complex. I've been feeling so desperate, said Marcia Alicia Martinez Padilla, 26, a migrant from Guatemala who added that her family has sold their tent to buy their base supplies like food and to toilet paper. I have no idea what to do. Since the election, Mr. Lopez Arbador has set a course intended to keep smooth relationship with Mr. Trump, who has made trade and migration the focal point of the complex relationship between the two countries. Mr. Lopez Arbador will take office on Saturday with an ambitious domestic agenda intended to tackle Mexico's entrenched inequality and spur development in the country's impoverished South. The last thing he wanted was a conflict with Mr. Trump that might rattle Mexico's markets. That helps explain why, despite his long-held reservations over free trade, Mr. Lopez Arbador signed off on a revised trade agreement that President Enrique Peña Nieto negotiated with the Trump administration, hoping to remove a central irritant in Mr. Trump's approach to Mexico. Mr. Lopez Obrador also sought a way to placate Mr. Trump over migration, an issue that Mr. Trump has made a centerpiece of his appeal to his supporters. In a letter to Mr. Trump a couple of weeks after his election, Mr. Lopez Obrador laid out a plan to tackle migration at its roots. 
the development in Mexico's southern region at a border with the United States as well as in Central America. Mexico was prepared to dedicate money to the effort. Michel Obrador wrote, and if the United States partnered with Mexico and Central American nations, we could gather a considerable quantity of resources to develop the region. His goal, he wrote, was that people find jobs at home so that migration would be an option, not a necessity. It was an ambitious proposal to a president who has focused on enforcement as a tool to limit migration in the United States. But then events in Central America took a turn that pushed the issue of immigration or of migration to the forefront. In October, migrants leaving Honduras formed a caravan to the United States, finding safety in numbers on the treacherous trip through Mexico where they are where they are prey for gangs. Mr. Lopez Obrador took a generous approach. The room for migrants in his development program in southern Mexico, he said in his incoming interior minister, Olga Sanchez Cordero, discussed granting one million work visas to Central Americans. But this weekend provided a case study of the problems brewing at the border. Reports say that Mr. Lopez Obrador's government was in talks to potentially house all migrants applying for asylum in the United States within Mexico's borders. And as soon as the idea surfaced, cabinet officials insist that no decision has been made. This is a complicated situation, but AMLO also has the opportunity to seize that crisis in the big moment, said Claudia Masfer, a migration expert at Colgio de Mexico. In the short term, however, he has to deal with the migrants reaching the border and the tensions in Tijuana, she said. She added, in that rising anger at the migrants inside Mexico, even though AMLO has a high approval rate, will create a strong opposition against him. First, Mr. Lopez Obrador needs to try and calm people down before, or calm people down on December 1st when he takes office, she said, because things are really heated up right now. Yeah, it sounds pretty chaotic, and who knows if they're going to get stopped in Mexico, if the Mexicans are going to try and push them further south to get out of their area, they're going to try and smooth things out to get him into the United States. I don't know. Things seem a little chaotic at the moment. It seems like everything going on in all facets of the world are a little chaotic right now. And the only bright side right now, at least for some consumers, is that I bought gas for almost $2 recently with the potential for it to drop. I saw it, the cheapest I've seen it is two o three in the Midwest, which is kind of ridiculous. It could drop below $2, which I haven't seen since I started driving. And even then, it was just over $2. So, who knows what's happening. But, that's really the only bright side of the news that's coming out. But, we're getting into the holiday season now, which... And there's a lot of snow right now in the Midwest. That's why I'm recording so late, because I was shoveling snow at work and all that fun stuff. But, that's the nature of this show. It kind of comes in whips and spurs and all of that. So, but that'll do it for Porn for this week. You can check us out. On journeyintocomics.com, you can get early access at patreon.com slash journeyintocomics. You can follow us on the socials at Poor News on Facebook and Instagram, which I don't post a lot. I am sorry for that. And you can just check out all the other shows at journeyintocomics.com, like Poor Entertainment, Journey into Comics, and all those other shows that we have out there. So that's it for Poor News for this week. I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks, guys.